Since the dawn of tabletop RPGs, a war has raged. Bigger than orcs and humans, bigger than dragons and giants, bigger even than good and evil. This war has been fought across tabletops the world over, between players and dungeon masters alike. Even the game designers have gotten involved in the struggle. Mages, masters of the arcane, dealers of death from afar, lords of realities both real and imagined. Their knowledge and unbridled academic might has sown both great chaos and lasting peace across the never-ending multiverse. Fighters. They are the armies of every world, in every plane, in all universes. Their shouts, a thunderous roar of destruction, salvation, and everything in between. They fight for honor, for greed, for heroism, for villainy. No war has ever been won on words alone, and there's no man or woman alive who need not fear the keen edge of a swordsman's blade. It's a strange matchup for sure. At first glance, you could easily dismiss the fighter in favor of the mage archetype's considerable magical talent. But, if you dig deeper, you begin to uncover a wealth of reasons that all mages should fear the stalwart fighter. This is as true as ever in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, where, once again, the seeming might of the mage archetype has been pruned once again. Since the dawn of D&D, the game designers have struggled to quantify magic in a form that was easily tracked, showed progression for individual characters, and was difficult to abuse. This gave rise to spell memorization and spell slots. Esoteric and confusing to those outside the system, it made spellcasters needlessly complex and difficult to pick up for new players. Though, unlike many other forms of gaming through the years, the spell slot system has seen almost no innovation at all. Remarkably, in 5th edition, the need to reserve specified number of casts was removed in favor of simply having a number of spell slots that could be used freely with any of your spell slots. No longer were spellcasters forced to choose all their spells for the day ahead of time. Instead of building a portfolio of useful spells and giving more flavor to the characters. A good change, in my opinion. But we can do more. Much more. So many limitations have been placed on spellcasters over the years in the name of balance and competitive play. It has always seemed that Wizards of the Coast were very afraid of spellcasters, and to a lesser extent, ranged in general, ruining their melee paradise. It's silly when you compare the two archetypes and the relevant power available to them. It doesn't matter what spells you choose or what level of play you consider, a fighter will always outperform a wizard in combat, if not because of the fact that they just deal less damage, then because they often are far more concerned with running out of resources than they need to be. After all, a fighter can't run out of sword points. In the early levels of 5e, this problem is somewhat alleviated by cantrips but the scaling of the damage and effects of the cantrips is quickly outpaced by the relative strength of melee characters, to the point that, in my high-level games, cantrips are now used exclusively for roleplay reasons and have virtually no relevance to gameplay. You might counter by claiming that the mage archetype's role in a party is to be a character who focuses on utility and enhancing their allies while offering support from a distance, and that's why they perform more poorly, but no, because the fighter archetype is more than flexible enough to encompass this aspect of gameplay as well. No matter how many different ways you break down the problem, it just comes down to the limitation of resources in one class that the other doesn't have. Again, you can't run out of sword, so what's the solution? Well, you could increase the potency of mage archetype magic to make up for the limited resources available to them as in previous editions, but that solution would impact games where combats happen once or less per game rather negatively, throwing the balance much farther back to the mage archetype than is necessary. You could make all spellcasting free, but then that invites players to cheese the odd spell or two that comes with this particularly lovely effect, but is normally too expensive to cast repetitively. Or, and this is the solution I've been using for over two years now, you could use a mana system. I've seen dozens of articles, YouTube videos, forum posts, and message boards where people have long talked of how to convert D&D to a mana-based system. But in each of these instances, there seems always to be an impossible problem. There are those that claim it just won't work, that mana is the same thing as spell slots and there's no point to it. 
There are those who convert completely to a mana system, but then try to rebalance the cost of spells given their spell level and how much they believe the spell is worth. And then there are my favorites. The ones who use a mana system and then go on to mark many of the spells as once per day only. All of these mana systems are problematic, for a number of reasons, and the solution is far simpler than any of them make it out to be. To address some of the concerns I will likely hear about this topic, no, making a mana system isn't pointless. And no, spell slots are not just as good. I have been a dungeon master for multiple games since 2013, and in all my time, and all my games, one of the biggest struggles has been getting players to track their spell slots. It just seems to be something that's hard for people to grasp, at least for the average player. They're not dumb, and they're not bad people. They're not trying to cheat. It's just something that it seems the average person has trouble quantifying. If you have no problem with it, then good for you, but seeing as I've run games for around 60 players at this point, I feel like I have a pretty good sample size. I noticed immediately after switching to my mana system that my players were actively marking off mana points and keeping good track of resources. They planned ahead and considered the cost of spells that they wanted to cast in the near future, being sure to budget out the resources accordingly. I no longer have to ask, okay, how many third level spells have you used today, because I'm pretty sure that was your fifth fireball. I'm sure I'll get feedback telling me how broken my spellcasters must be if I don't impose limits on how many of what level of spell I allow them to cast per day. And to that my response is, have you read what the higher level spells are like in 5th edition? They're not like they were in 2nd edition, or even 3rd or 3.5. They're boring. Most of them have limited application, and the ones that deal direct damage are really, really meager. In the rare times I was able to play in a game, rather than run one, I always picked a spellcaster. Not because they were my favorite. Fighter is definitely my favorite class but because they're just so underrepresented and someone needs to show people how cool they can be. This is really hard when your most powerful and iconic spells, the ones you can only cast once or twice a day, deal about as much damage as an infinitely repeatable attack from a fighter, and the effects of your spells can almost always be replicated by a magic item in-game. If I've learned anything in my years as a DM, it's that balance is never a reason to tell someone no. I'm not advocating that you let your players become edgelord gods who kill everything with a thought from the shadowy corner of a tavern at the end of the earth, but I am saying that if you tell someone they can't do something cool because the other players can't do that cool thing, what you're really saying is that you lack the talent and skill as a dungeon master to let one player have a moment to shine while keeping your other players confident that they will each have moments themselves. I've had my fair share of run-ins with rules lawyers in the past. Each and every one of them came to understand that arguing rules with me wasn't going to get them very far, because there's only one rule that I and many other great DMs follow. The rule of cool. If it's awesome, let it happen. It'll make for a great story. No one tells their friends or relatives or everyone at the game store about that one time they had a great idea, but the DM said no. Now, with all the philosophy and reason out of the way, what actually is my mana system, you may be wondering? Well, it's, uh... It's incredibly simple. First, you need to calculate your mana. Let's say you're a 5th level wizard. Ordinarily, you'd have 4 first level spells, 3 second level spells, and 2 third level spells. Well, in my system, you would have 1 point of mana for each spell level you would normally have. So, our 5th level wizard would have 16 mana, 4 mana from the 4 first level spells, 6 mana from the 3 second level spells, and six more from the two third level spells. Additionally, I allow my players to add their spellcasting modifier to their mana pool. Let's say our fifth level wizard has a 15 intelligence, pretty average score, and gets an additional two mana points. Now the mad lad is up to 18 mana points. So, our fifth level friend can now cast 18 first level spells per day, nine second level spells per day, six third level spells per day, or any combination their little heart desires. Now, you may be asking yourself, they have enough mana to cast 9th level spells, can they cast those? No, of course not. The mana system doesn't bring higher tiers of magic online any earlier than the standard rules. Uh, consider it like this. My simple mana system awards them with additional mana every level or so, as they begin to understand how to empower their spells to ever greater heights. They get to cast higher level spells when the book awards them higher level spell slots. So, if we extrapolate this out and take a high-level look at things, 
What really changes about our wizard friend at 20th level? Well, they can cast a lot more flexibly than before, but are they the overpowered gods the game designers seem to think they are? Let's do some quick math and find out. At 20th level, our wizard friend under my simple mana system would have a baseline mana of 89 points. Let's assume they have achieved the mortal limit of intelligence of 20 points in that score and give them a bonus of 5 mana for 94 total mana points. Next, we'll translate that to raw spellcasting power. Let's take chance to hit out of the equation and assume our wizard goes crazy with some magic missiles. According to rules as written, magic missile can be cast at 9th level. Given that our wizard has 94 mana, he can cast magic missile at 9th level 10 times with 4 mana left over. So let's just say he casts a spell 10 times at 9th and once at 4th level. Magic missile deals 1d4 plus 1 damage per spell level in which it's cast, and a d4's average roll is 2.5. So 2.5 multiplied by 9 plus 9 gives us the almighty total of 31.5. In D&D, you round down damage delta creatures, so our mighty 9th level magic missile deals a whopping 31 points of damage on average. Multiply that by 10, and we're looking at 315 damage. Adding in our remaining 4th level magic missile brings us up to 329 damage dealt. That's pretty pathetic. Surely, there are more efficient spells available, right? Well, of course there are. Next, we'll calculate the damage using one of D&D's most famous spells, Fireball. The designers themselves have admitted that this spell was intentionally overpowered for 5th edition simply because it's an iconic spell. So, it must be pretty good, right? It's a 3rd level spell, but we'll again be casting it at 9th level, which means it will deal 14 d6 damage per cast. So again, at our 10 casts, plus our 4th level cast, this should make for much more damage, right? Well, maybe. See, creatures targeted by Fireball get a saving throw against the difficulty class of the spellcaster. We'll assume for now your DM isn't fudging the die rolls to save his or her monsters, and assuming once again our 20th level mage has 20 intelligence, the formula for DCs is 8 plus proficiency plus casting modifier. So our wizard spell DC is 19. A DC 19 spell or trap in the Dungeon Master's Guide is considered a moderate to hard DC for a player character. So, on average, a creature will succeed on their saving throw about 63% of the time. So that means about 63% of the time, the creature will only take half damage from the fireball spell. This is of course assuming that they're fighting challenge rating appropriate creatures at around 20th level. So, adding all this together means that our 20th level wizard, casting fireball at its greatest level, will deal on average 49 points of damage. Not too bad. Multiply that by 10, and we get 490 points of damage, and not forgetting our 4th level fireball for an additional 31 damage, for a total of 521 damage. It's actually not too bad. A fighter can still do better, but wait, I forgot. Only 37% of the fireballs deal full damage. That means our entire mana pool only equates to about uh, 358 damage, and that's over the course of 11 rounds. Alright. Let's really take it to the max here. What about the most powerful spell in D&D? What if we calculate using... Meteor Swarm? Well, it's a ninth level spell, so for our remaining four mana points, we'll use Vitriolic Sphere, the most powerful spell available at fourth level by average damage. Uh, Meteor Swarm deals 20d6 plus 20d6 fire and bludgeoning damage, which equates out to an average damage of 140 points per cast. Multiply this by our standard 10 cast for a damage output of 1400, plus the additional average damage of Vitriolic Sphere, 37.5, which brings us to a grand total of 1437. Or at least it would, if not for those darn saves. Again, our poor wizard's spell DC hasn't changed, it's still 19, a below average DC, meaning our target only takes half damage from our swarm of meteors 67% of the time. Thus, the grand total damage from the mightiest wizard imaginable, even breaking all the rules of D&D, would be 597 damage over 11 rounds. And that's assuming the victim also failed its vitriolic sphere save. Divide that by 11 and we get 54 damage per round. I can tell you from experience, that is nothing. I've seen characters at level 15 get a crit and a good roll and blow that out of the water. By level 20, dealing 54 damage per round is closer to expectation than reality. My favorite class, the fighter, can expect to deal 50 to 60 damage per round at level 20 regularly. And that's rules as written. Not my apparently broken super over-the-top nonsense. 
Even with my system and the most efficient and best use of mana possible, spellcasters are just barely able to keep up, and in some cases they still lose out. A battlemaster, two weapon fighting fighter can easily push 65 to 70 damage per round on average. That's just average. Moral of the story, now I calculated all the ways that Wizards of the Ghost makes me sad in 5th edition version of D&D. I then broke all available math and logic and still lost to a guy with a pointy bit of metal. A uh, full explanation of the mana system will be linked below in the description. Please share your thoughts on this topic with me in the comments below. Oh, and uh, one final thought for those who question my math. I, I might have gotten some of it wrong, actually, uh, but uh, let's just assume those meteors did maximum damage each time and forget about the saving throw. That brings us to 130 damage per round, and wizards could only do it for 11 rounds. Fighters can swing their sword infinitely. <laughs>